Katie Wonka Wing. We're discussing today's headlines now with Sonia and Giles, who's joining us all the way down the line from Edinburgh. I feel like you've been there forever. <laughs> Are you having a good time? I'm having the most wonderful time. I'm oh. here for the whole of August because I'm appearing on the fringe, but I'm also getting close to the locals. I've had an amazing week. I went to Edinburgh Castle, you can see the picture of it just behind me, uh, to, as a guest of the governor of Edinburgh Castle to see the incredible military tattoo, the royal military tattoo. That was an amazing event. There I am with the governor. Yeah, yes. fantastic. <laughs> That's his house in the background. And, and then last night, who do you think I met up with but Nicola Sturgeon? Yes, really? so I'm really mingling with the locals. I was trying to persuade her to lend me her camper van because it's very expensive staying up here. And I thought maybe she could help out. Anyway, we, we had fun. Has she really got a camper van? Well, it's a little joke. Uh, oh, no. We're up on the fringe <laughs> and, and we make lots of jokes up on the fringe. Oh, yeah, sorry. Um, Giles. Just nurse, nurse your voice, Andy. <laughs> uh, le leave the talking to Josie, she knows what you're doing. <laughs> I'm fine. Um, Giles, I mean, you do mingle with some very um, influential people, including Sir Michael Parkinson. So I'm really sorry to um, about yesterday and the sad passing of Michael Parkinson. Um, I mean, can you tell me what he meant to you? Well, he was one of my heroes. He was a, he was a great man. He was a lovely human being. And uh, he kept on working right to the end. I mean, I saw him only a few months ago. He's been touring the country doing a show with his son about his incredible career. I first met him in the 1970s. In fact, he did a, a television program with my wife when she was very young. And he was quite young too, 50 years ago. It was a daytime program with my wife and him and Derek Hart one of who remembers Derek Hart. He did so much more than the chat shows. Uh, I got to know him quite well when I did a series of uh, Give Us a Clue, and he was the host of that for a while. And we had fun with that, I must say. But what was interesting, he, he loved light entertainment. He was a journalist fundamentally, but he enjoyed the, the fun of entertainment. And uh, it, was, it was lovely knowing him. He was a publisher, he was a cricket enthusiast. He was a man of many interests. Fundamentally though, he was a journalist who was in love with cinema and old fashioned show business, the great stars of the silver screen. And that's how he began and his chat show began. It led from a program called Cinema where he celebrated the movies and then began this chat show where he gave people time to talk. And what was brilliant about him, he was as interested in the people, not in what he had to say. He wanted to bring out the best in his guests and he did, which is why we remember conversations that he had that took place 30, 40, 50 years ago, they still ring, with, ring in with us. Do you know what? You're, you're absolutely right, Giles. They still do. And let's have a look at some of his greatest conversations. You, you hear stories of some champions who say one of the problems is that every guy thinks he can fight you, wants to take you on, and he's going to prove it someday in a bar, you know. Have you ever, ever had that at all? Never had anybody daft enough? Oh, if a man, if a man dreamed... <laughs> if, he, if he even dreamed to be, he'd better wake up and apologise. <laughs> David is, uh, I call him Golden Balls, you know, now, because, I mean, he's, like, he's like, uh, going to be Golden one of those... Balls, Becky, mate. <laughs> <laughs> one of those things I shouldn't have said, but... You don't have to make friends with it, so... Yeah. Uh, try hard. Yeah, you can make friends. He's it's, it's, it's quite friendly if you just stroke him like that. Really? See, so look. <laughs> <laughs> Such a great clip, such a memorable clip as well. Absolutely, and as a journalist, uh, you know, for, I, I grew up watching his uh, talk show and I think he's one of the world's most formidable interviewers for all the reasons that Giles mm. said. You know, he let people shine and let them talk in their own words and made them feel comfortable. And all journalists, I think, kind of look at him as an interviewer and learn something from him about how to do interviews. So he is definitely a bit of a legend amongst, amongst my profession. Yeah, and we kind of forget that he did come from daytime television you know, because you must have been at TVAM when he was at TVAM as well. He was one of the absolute forerunners of breakfast television in the world, wasn't he, Giles? He was. He was there on day one of commercial TV's breakfast television at TVAM. It didn't actually work. He wasn't successful, in fact. He and, and a team, including David Frost and Andrew Rippon and others, started TVAM, but it was a little bit too high-powered for so early in the day, it was felt, a bit too serious. They were rather too heavy in their suits. So they were replaced, in fact, by people like me and Roland Ratt. 
<laughs> That's what happened to TVAM. But he liked trying different things. And it's interesting. I mean, he was also a bit of a flirt, it must be said. Oh, he loved a pretty face. He really got on well with Miss Piggy, but with all those other ladies as well. He was an interesting <laughs> mixture, show business and journalism. But if you asked him ever what his favorite interview was, he talked about Dr. Jacob Bronowski and a serious interview he did about Dr. Bronowski uh, visiting a concentration camp uh, after the war. Uh, he combined those two elements to him. He was a very special person, actually. It, very sad that he's gone, but what a beautiful legacy yeah, absolutely. that he's a real left loss. behind. Yeah. A real loss. Uh, Giles, thank you for sharing those memories with us. So let's talk about other things in the news today. Of course, we've got that World Cup final happening on Sunday. Interestingly, though, nobody from the royal family or nor the Prime Minister are choosing to go to Australia. No. I think there's been a real mixed reaction about this, hasn't there? There has. And on one level, it's quite an odd choice. So if you look at the Spanish team, they've got um, the Queen of Spain is going over to support. Uh, but both Prince William, who's the uh, chair of the FA, and Rishi Sunak, both of them have declined to attend. Now, it is a very long flight. It's a 22 hour flight, you know, it's slap bang in the middle of August. But there is a bit of me... In first just... class, it'll be fine, I promise you. <laughs> <laughs> no, honestly, You'd in know. first class, it will be absolutely fine. I mean, look, They'll if, be fine. let's just put it this way. If I was Prime Minister of yeah. the UK, I'd be on the first flight out to Sydney. Yeah. Um, so, uh, but, but, you know, I don't think it's going to ruin the mood or anything. Everyone, the whole country is behind the lionesses. I just think it's going to feel like s such an amazing thing that happens on Sunday, whatever the result, but come on, we all want them to win. All right. But, um... but Giles, Giles, I want you, do, do you think it sends the wrong signal. I don't think the Prime Minister needs to go. I want the Prime Minister, to be honest, to be concentrating on the cost of living and actually thinking about things like Ukraine. That's his job. But the Prince of Wales is not only the head of the FA, but he's also the president of a charity called Fields in Trust that used to be called the National Playing Fields Association. He took over from the late Duke of Edinburgh. And it protects playgrounds, playing fields for young people, people with disabilities, and girls as well as boys to have an opportunity to play sport. And we need to protect our playing fields and we need to encourage all young people into sport. And so I would love to have seen him take that long flight, indeed in first class, because you get there sooner, you know, if you go yes, first class. Yes, if you're at the front uh, of the plane. It, it I would feels love like have, it goes quicker. I, I imagine, I have to say, I've never flown first class. <laughs> I, would, um, I would love to have seen him going. Um, but, frankly, they can cheer from anywhere. We'll all be watching, um, you know, we'll all be watching and cheering. And this thing of 1-0 of that one of the teachers was predicting, I have to tell you, it's going to be 3-2. It's going to be a nail-biter all the way. Oh, oh. as well. I literally yeah. think it's going to be 3-2. Well, I mean, that's what well, it's going to be, then. I have to say, well, I'm quite excited the queen, seeing the Queen of Spain stand. I didn't even know Spain had a queen. So <laughs> to see her cheering is going to be amazing. I bet she's really glamorous. But do you think it, they would be there if it was the men's Hang World Cup Hang on a minute, Cup there final? she is. We're looking oh, at look. oh, yeah, just, oh, let's just have a quick look. Oh, he's got a lot of medals and stuff, hasn't he? Um, like a, the, hat, the, job, the I hat is slightly lampshady, though. I can't lie. The hat is slightly lampshady, but she looks great. Do you Ola. know what, Good morning, I... Your Majesty. Ola. It's a, it's a good question, Josie, you're about to ask her about whether... Yeah, do you think they would be there if it was the World's yeah. Men Cup final? Do you think they would... I, I, I don't think that that's what's... Because I, I, I actually just don't think that people are thinking about this as, you know, oh, it's women's football, so it's not as important. I actually think it's incredible how in the last two years the following around women's football has changed so dramatically. I got my friend to look up the figures of um, the viewing figures of the match on Wednesday. Semi-final, Wednesday morning, working day. Over 10 million people tuned into that match. Working from home. Working from home. Exactly. <laughs> or even like, I mean, there were loads of offices that just screened it in their office. I mean, this is a Sunday final, England's yeah. first World Cup um, final presence since 1966. I'm going to be so interested to see the figures, but I, I really don't think people are thinking about this as men's football, women's football. No. It's the women who've got us to the final. I think that's amazing and something to be celebrated. And I don't think that Prince William or Rishi Sunak are making different decisions. I'm going to give them the benefit of the doubt. I don't think they're and thinking about it differently. There's good news, too, for churchgoers. Mm -hmm. I, I mentioned that I'd been to Edinburgh Castle for the tattoo with the governor of Edinburgh Castle. One of the other guests was the Bishop of London. Um, I think she's the first female yes, Bishop of London. Yeah. And she was telling me that the churches are going to give special dispensation. If you are somebody who goes to a Sunday morning service, 
either to the eight o'clock communion service for the Book of Common Prayer or to matins at 10 or 11 o'clock. This Sunday, you are allowed to wake early, do your prayers privately, and then watch the box and see the game. You're going to be excused going to church on Sunday. I have it direct from the bishop. OK, and also pubs. Uh, are, are wanting to open early as well and get that sort of get people drinking at 10 o'clock. Yeah, so well, so the issue is that lots of pubs are only licensed to serve alcohol from 11 and yeah. some from 12 noon. And so pubs are sort of saying, I think there are a few pubs who sort of looked at what was happening and applied for an earlier licence early, but for other pubs, they've not got the time to it. I mean, I guess the one thing I would say is that if you can serve drink at 11 and the match starts at 11, maybe you don't want people getting too tanked up before 11 a.m. Yeah. So, um, but I can see why people might want to have a glass of, you know, a celebratory pint or a celebratory glass of fizz at 10 a.m. in the morning, but it is quite early, isn't it? Well, talking about how you're going to celebrate, that's really interesting because the Lionesses uh, celebrated in their very own unique way when they mm. won uh, against Australia. Uh, they actually had chips and gravy. Um, Yum. <laughs> <laughs> it's all I can say to that. Giles, would chips and what gravy be on your celebratory list? What more do you want in life? Chips and gravy. I shall be having vegan gravy, of course, but you can't do better than chips. And actually, I wouldn't be needing alcohol at 10 in the morning. I think we'll all be on a high for them. I mean, we're really wanting them to win. Uh, exactly. No question of that at all. Couldn't agree more. Couldn't yeah. agree more. Yes, we do. Thank you, Giles. Thank you, Sonia. Yes, yeah, stay with us as we'll be discussing more of today's top stories with Sonia and Giles right after this.